Well, hi everyone, and welcome to another definitive lesson about widescreen technologies. Last time I talked about aspect ratios to give you a foundation. This time I want to talk about anamorphic cinematography. It's the basis of the process that I talked about earlier called Cinemascope. So what do I mean anamorphic cinematography? What is that? Well, it's a distortion of the image with a specific benefit in mind. Uh, let me just show you here. I have a special lens. This is an anamorphic lens. This one is actually an original Bausch & Lomb Cinemascope lens made for a projector. You can see on the front it's round and on the back it's round. But if you were to look straight down the barrel of this lens, you can see that it's, well, it's doing something weird. It's distorting that circle on the end. Now that's a circle. Why does it look like an ellipse? It looks like it's stretched or squeezed, depending on your point of view there. Why would I want to squeeze the image through this lens? Well, that's part of what makes CinemaScope work. You see, they wanted to make the picture wider. In fact, twice as wide as it was without having to reinvent the whole camera, the projector, the kind of film they were using. So they used this lens, which has a two to one squeeze on it. So you could take a wide, wide image that you're looking at, you know, through, through the camera, and you can squeeze that down so it will fit on the negative frame, which is not very wide. So in effect, a two to one squeeze on what you're seeing right now would look something like this. And on CinemaScope movies, this is actually how the image appears on the negative. So everyone handling the movie through the entire process of actually making that movie is going to be seeing this on the film itself. Then there's a lens on the projector like this one that's going to stretch that image back out so that it looks proper and it looks extra wide up on the CinemaScope screen. Now, um, they still use this process today for a lot of the movies that are made. And even if they were not shot with CinemaScope anamorphic lenses like that, they still use them on projectors in the theaters. You see, there are a lot of processes since CinemaScope that give you widescreen results. CinemaScope was the easiest one at first because all you really had to do was change the lens and then, you know, modify the screen at the movie theater. Um, now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this anamorphic squeeze that they put on the image for the negative and then stretch it back out again, um, isn't that going to, like, degrade the picture somehow by distorting and then re-distorting? You're going to lose some quality in the picture, aren't you? Well, good for you. I'm going to give you a gold star for being awfully clever for realizing that, that yes, that is a fact. That's true. In fact, I'm going to take this gold star and I'm going to uh, squeeze it anamorphically and then the other way just to show you how clever I am. So, whew. all right. So, um, other processes were out there that used anamorphic lenses like CinemaScope um, and they had different names like uh, Toho scope and other things that sort of had scope in the name. Eventually, uh, Bausch & Lomb, which was making these, these lenses for, uh, for CinemaScope for 20th Century Fox, well, they were bested by other companies. Other companies were making lenses that did it better than the CinemaScope lenses. And, and sort of chief among those was the Panavision company, uh, always well known for their great optics, their great lenses. And so the Panavision anamorphic lenses were actually better for the CinemaScope process than the CinemaScope lenses themselves. So eventually, after a few years of CinemaScope being around, other technologies sort of superseded it. And even 20th Century Fox, which started the ball rolling with CinemaScope, uh, didn't even use the CinemaScope process anymore. So, um, yeah, but uh, then we get back to that thing where, you know, it degrades the picture. Well, this was still the easiest, simplest way to get it done without having to reinvent the film itself. I mean, you could use a bigger, bigger piece of film to, uh, to actually make the movie, uh, put this in the camera, and also, uh, you know, have a big wide piece of film like this in the projector uh, instead of, here's, see, here's 35 millimeter film. And this is, you know, what's running through the projector. 
this is, is actually, uh, you know, the, the wider gauge uh, film for the large formats. And well, the problem with this, of course, was that you did have to reinvent the camera and uh, reinvent the projector. And uh, so CinemaScope was a lot easier to start out with. But there were other processes in the 50s that did different things to achieve widescreen. There was, you know, the, these wide formats, uh, the VistaVision or, you know, 65 millimeter or 70 millimeter, those sorts of things. There was also Cinerama. Cinerama was a process that actually had three, three cameras rolling at once, synchronized. And one was getting the middle image, one was getting the image over there, and one was getting the image over there. And those three strips of film were simultaneously running through the camera when they made the movie, and also simultaneously running through projectors in the theater. Three strips of film going at once, so you get this extra wide uh, screen there. But that was a whole new can of worms there with Cinerama, because you had, you had to keep three cameras perfectly synchronized and keep three projectors perfectly synchronized and it's a lot of hassle a lot of technical stuff a lot of things that could go wrong and ultimately there weren't a lot of movies made in Cinerama because some of these other processes came around that were actually you know easier than that so um, yeah that's just sort of an overview of what anamorphic means so once again you're taking the original image that you're seeing through the lens, that wide vista that you might be seeing, and you're squeezing it so it'll fit on your narrow negative. And then in the theater, you're stretching it back out to fill the entire screen and get that wide, wonderful CinemaScope picture. Now, uh, today, when I'm talking about uh, video formats that you might use in your home theater with your DVD player or even in your video camera, you have the capability to do anamorphic video or 16 by 9 enhanced video. And so uh, while this is an optical process using lenses to create that anamorphic squeeze, there is an electronic process for anamorphic squeeze, and that's the anamorphic video that I'd like to go into more detail with in our next lesson. But first I thought I'd just let you know, how did anamorphic get into the mix? It was this, uh, this cinemascope thing that was going on. Now, I mentioned that there are some visual artifacts as a result of the distortion and, you know, undistortion of the picture using the CinemaScope process. Um, well, yeah, if, if you pay close attention, you can see some things are happening to the picture that make it not ideal, not crisp and clean and as wonderful as it could be. But the trade-off, and again, back in the 50s, when CinemaScope was introduced, the, the trade-off was that you're still getting this wide, wonderful picture that looks so cool when you're watching it on screen back in the... So um, generally, critics, audiences all seem to agree that the trade-off, the slight loss of quality because of the squeezing and unsqueezing, uh, was worth it to get the widescreen experience in, in, in that time. All right, so next time, again, we'll talk about anamorphic video. And this could get kind of fun.